Saigon Yalchin, welcome to the Maz Hakim podcast. Thanks for having me. Saigon, billionaire entrepreneur, I want to know all about how your journey began. Tell me about that moment. Well, I came here in 2009 to Dubai with a backpack, fresh grad from Germany. And yeah, I started an online fashion store. I thought that was something we need here in Dubai. Well, mm-hmm. I didn't actually know a lot about Dubai. I just did a bit of research and see what's been offered online. It wasn't a lot, mm-hmm. but I saw a lot of people already being online and looking for something, right? Back then, it was all about reading the news online, maybe social media, but it wasn't about transactions. So you couldn't really buy or wouldn't really buy a lot online, especially because people weren't really ready to use their credit cards online more like cash on delivery. So I thought if there's a lot of uh, people looking for stuff, then if you offer a great service or product online, there should be a big business as a result. Mm -hmm. So we started that and uh, yeah, I'm fast forwarding. It became the first and then the largest uh, online fashion store in the Middle East, which we've then in 2012, we merged it. Uh, with souk.com. So the company I founded is souk.com. We merged it with souk.com. It then became the largest e-commerce company in the Middle East. Uh, And yeah, fast forwarding to 2017, Amazon bought that group. Well, in the meantime, in 2013, I founded uh, sellanycar.com, which is the largest online car trader in the Middle East. Actually, I just checked the database. Over 60% of all cars here are registered with us. So, yeah, we know who's driving which car. And we buy and sell online now. I think it's always been about solving problems online. So back then it was being able to buy clothes online or accessories online. Then it moved into pretty much buying anything online. Mm -hmm. And now it's about you know, solving the problem of selling your used car without hassles. And did you always have the traits of an entrepreneur or did you move into the corporate world for a while and then decided you didn't like it? (laughs) I, well, look, I started trying to become a professional football player. That didn't work out. Then I tried as a DJ. That wasn't really something I would say scalable at least for me and mm-hmm. then I tried uh, to become an aesthetic plastic surgeon that wow was, <laughs> that's that, different <laughs> yeah that was that was a that was really bad I got fired from an unpaid internship how difficult is that? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so yeah so that didn't work out and then later on you know again I'm fast forwarding my life a lot here but generally I started at a business school Mm -hmm. I fell in love with entrepreneurship. And I think that is the ultimate way of solving problems. And if someone's listening now and say life is not going so good for them, maybe they've been fired from a job or they've been made redundant, what advice would you give to them? Because you've experienced some failures. What advice would you give to them? Yes, I think that's the beautiful part about entrepreneurship like you only see the success and all the stuff that didn't work out nobody knows about because Mm -hmm. they didn't work out unless it's a big bang but generally I always say you have time like the average I don't know the average millionaire is 37 the average Mm -hmm. billionaire is 67 Mm -hmm. so it's not really something you really run out of time with I hear a lot of 20 year olds or 20 something year olds thing I have to become a millionaire quick no you have time I usually say if you are a teenager just enjoy life especially look up to year 25 you should actually enjoy your youth it should not be all about making money and uh, <laughs> kind of focusing on that first million mm-hmm. and definitely you should not focus on a number you should focus on your ultimate why Right. Yeah. So you have time. That's one of my uh, advices. I would also say that the quick money schemes that they're out there and combined with this loose 
easy to get mindset you get everywhere from social media saying look if you have the right mindset you believe in yourself and here's a scheme to get rich that's the ultimate recipe for success i don't believe in that mm-hmm. i believe you should look into building a big empire that takes decades a great company is built within decades not within even a few years so take your time focus on your customer and what actually are you offering to the market mm-hmm. that they would be willing to pay you a margin for right i can give you a great example because you said people are um losing their jobs or sometimes they are switching from yeah. a job and jumping into the so called cold water of entrepreneurship right and there is a concept which is really um well if you i'm going to explain it in a very um easy to understand way all right so because it's a bit technical mm-hmm. so generally when you work for a company um you get salary right that's what most people do actually yeah. um over it depends on the country but um uh, the most entrepreneurial countries have 85% employees approximately so it's still even if you're the most entrepreneurial com- country it's like yeah. 15% entrepreneurs mm-hmm. and the least are around 2% so most people are employees which mm-hmm. is fine so when you then decide to switch from an employee status to a entrepreneurship journey then what you actually have to look at is two things one something we call accounting profit which basically means the profit your business is generating mm-hmm. but then also an economic profit which ba- is an holistic view of the market okay. so let me explain this so you're making i don't know let's say $100,000 a year in salary mm-hmm. right now you switch and build your own business and you make 50,000 in profits mm-hmm. so now from your business point of view you had a $50,000 accounting profit but from the market if you look at it as an economy yeah we had a loss because you used to generate $100,000 in value now you only generate $50,000 in, in value now let's say you built this business and suddenly you see okay this is working you make 50,000 60,000 70,000 and you see other people are also joining the market and are becoming competitors. Mm-hmm. Now what usually happens is if the demand remains the same but the supply increases, everybody is offering a similar product, yeah. then your margins will reduce to a point where your profits are pretty much lower than what you would have made in salary. So then people go back to the job market and they yeah. say ah forget it i'm not making enough money with my business i'm going to go back to the job market and this keeps on going in a circle then people decide again oh i should start this new business and they go back into that market mm-hmm. and it leads to lower margins the businesses that actually stay are the ones that have something called defensibility okay. something they can defend with saying i build a brand or i have network effects or i have economies of scale all of those things that keep you successful so to summarize switch your job to an entrepreneurial role if you un- understand how you can defend your product long term how you can build a brand maybe or have network effects or economies of scale mm-hmm. but something that's not just going to flood the market with just another supplier yeah If someone's listening now and they want to move into entrepreneurship, is it possible for them to have a full-time job and have a business on the side? And how's the best way to do that? Uh a side hustle is not entrepreneurship. Okay. I I think um you will you will not have time to solve a problem in the market on the side, right? Mm-hmm. You're just going to have a side hustle. That's just maybe something you can do f- short term where people are going to pay you a margin that you probably not deserve mm-hmm. because you know if you can solve it on the side then somebody else will solve it on the side maybe as a full-time job even mm-hmm. and solve it in a better manner so generally you're going to have a race to the bottom if it's doable on the side 
then there's going to be zero margins at one point of time in a perfect market. So they should delve into it, dive into it. Yeah, entrepreneurship is never a part-time job. Okay. Entrepreneurship <laughs> is more than a full-time job, I think. it's. And I always say, look, it's it's going to take you 18 hours a day. Mm -hmm. So you better build a big successful business yeah. rather than a small successful business because both of them are going to take almost all the hours you have in a day. So what about if someone has a dream of entrepreneurship but they have a family to support, they have to pay rent and they're listening right now, things are expensive, inflation, what is the best advice? Should they stay in their nine to five job that they're really unhappy with? Or is it possible to move into entrepreneurship and take those risks? Well, that is that is the most crucial moment. So that's why when you're very young, you don't have all these responsibilities. It's easier to do. Mm -hmm. Maybe you live with your parents. But when you have kids and you have a family to feed, I mm -hmm. understand that you have to build a certain cushion. For those moments, side hustles might help, right? Where you say, all right, I need to build that cushion so yeah. I have a year and a half or two years of you know money that I can actually or time in this manner to actually dedicate to mm, entrepreneurship yeah. but again entrepreneurship does not mean putting your own capital always into the endeavor you can also work with business angels investors that take on the financial risk because mm -hmm. there are four types of risk financial risk team risk product risk and market risk mm -hmm. so you don't have to take on all the risks yourself Right. You can outsource that financing risk. I mean, early money is expensive money, so the later you do that, the better for you. But again, what's the investor's job? It's to invest. And if someone's listening right now and they're generally just not happy with their job, what's your advice to them? Uh, well, I think it depends on why, right? There is, I always look at my team and try to figure out who the stars are. Right? There's this will skill metric. So if somebody is highly skilled and highly motivated, mm -hmm. well, that's that's a star. But usually you don't have all your team members in that quadrant. Yeah. So sometimes it happens that somebody is highly skilled but not really motivated. Or somebody is highly motivated but not really skilled. Mm -hmm. That's where I can work. That's where I can work with my team. So your line manager should understand that. If your line manager doesn't see that in you, that either you're very skilled, but something is wrong with your motivation, so he should look into that, mm -hmm. or you are not really skilled, but you're highly motivated, so he should train you. Mm -hmm. So this is the job of the line manager, if you're reporting to somebody, which uh, everybody does. Then, um, well, if, if usually if you look at these scenarios, people leave because of their line managers. It's, it's rarely because... Uh, they don't believe in the business model. It's rarely because they kind of need a bit of uh, a pay rise. Mm -hmm. It's mostly because there's an issue with the line manager. Yeah. And that's something where you can either talk to, you know, the HR department or you just move. Escalate it. <laughs> yeah, but I'm not an expert in... Uh, in actually, I've never been it. really a full-time employee somewhere. Yeah, you're an employer now, though. Yeah, I've always been. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned in, in one of your interviews that when looking into a CV, you look for values rather than the actual CV or necessarily experience or where they studied or the experience they have. What advice would you give to somebody if their CV is not necessarily up to scratch? Like They, they may not have gone to the best school, but they have all the right traits to be hired. Well, I don't really look at the CVs. That's when it comes to me. Like usually, the um, candidates have passed the basic checks, yeah. right? And the CV for me is well. It shows me where you have worked and which positions, but it doesn't tell me if you're a good human or not. And I really look at that first. Mm -hmm. I think the values are the ones. It's like a construction site where you see the foundation. And if the foundation is small or shaky, or it's built on sand, then you know the height of the building will not be really uh, impressive. Mm 
mm-hmm. right? So, and it probably not will not be solid. So the foundation of a human is his or her character, which is based on values. Mm-hmm. And you can't find those values in a CV. You find them with uh, experience. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, 15, 14 years ago, I was not an experienced CEO. I was really looking at uh, CVs and thought if there were big names and big titles, I should hire them, which was totally wrong. I hired wrong people. And they left me, right? So it's at the end of the day, um, the the trick is to find people with good values that are motivated and that you are willing to train. Mm-hmm. Obviously, if you have highly val- highly motivated, highly skilled people, these are fat cats you usually can't afford in a startup. Mm-hmm. So I'd say focus on being a good human, which you can get from your parents when you grow up, from your circle, and also be among people that actually have similar values. I mean, we, we define some like respect, integrity, also dependability, uh, stuff you cannot really teach an adult. Mm -hmm. Robin Sharma says adversity builds mastery. And Michael Jordan said, I've lost almost 300 games 26 times. I've been trusted to take the game winning shot and I've missed. I've failed over and over again, again in my life. And that is why I succeed. Can you tell me about some moments where we touched on it briefly earlier, but can you tell me some moments where you failed in your life and it's taught you something? Oh, yeah. It actually really is a good transition to what I just said before. I hired people based on CVs. I thought, well, there's people from Silicon Valley. I kind of imported them to Dubai and I said, look, these guys know everything about Internet and tech. And I figured out these were not good humans. Um, so they hired family members they uh, behind my back or started a competitor behind my back. Wow. So at the end of the day, um, what did I gain? I basically lost my first uh, 20 team members and I had to start over again with a new mentality, right? And that is something I gained from this experience, saying mm-hmm. don't look at... Uh, well, don't look at a piece of paper and judge a human. Talk to humans. Also, uh, try to get different perspectives, not only your own decision, but get data, get um, other team members to look at you, your hires. Also, find somebody with a different perspective. Not only, like, if you have a room full of men, maybe you should ask a woman as well. Or mm-hmm. if it's all the same age, ask somebody older or somebody with a whole different cultural background, but bring in a different perspective. And at the end of the day, I say, don't take a big decision until you found somebody that disagrees. Mm -hmm. If everybody agrees, it's not a big decision. So generally, if you wanna build a, a big company and a solid company, you should have a solid team because they will actually make it happen. And how important is networking when it comes to entrepreneurship? I mean, in Dubai, I feel like everybody's obsessed with building a network and, you know, I I know it's very important, but can you do entrepreneurship on your own or do you need to have a strong network? Oh, you can't build entrepreneurship on your own. That You will be a solopreneur doing side hustles. That doesn't mean you should be on every conference and giving out your business cards. I think you should focus on your customer and the network that makes sense will actually become your network. What I mean with that is there's no point in collecting business cards and say, oh, I know this person. Even if I would know the most powerful person here in the country, there's no point in me, him or her talking to um, each other Mm -hmm. if we don't add value on, on both sides of the table. Like. If I'm just somebody asking for stuff, then you will not get it until you actually can also add value. If you can add value, then you will anyway find the person you need to talk to. Mm -hmm. So knowing somebody might get you to a a meeting faster, but the ultimate decision of if you can get stuff done Mm -hmm. is only if you can really add value. So networking kind of, for me, has become 
uh, mostly, name dropping. <laughs> and mostly a waste of time. Yeah. Yeah, I find a lot of people, they network for the sake of name dropping. I spoke to Chris Voss, who's a former FBI hostage negotiator, and he also talks about, um, I guess, tactics of negotiation. And he always says that you need to add value to someone else, exactly what you said, before you ask for anything in return. So mm. offering that is always a lot more, I guess, beneficial. Um, you're a billionaire. What do you spend your money on? What's the most expensive thing you've bought? <laughs> well, first of all, billionaire, I wouldn't say that until my company is actually being sold and then we know what it's <laughs> worth. So generally, I would be very cautious with net worth, especially because most of our net worth is in our companies mm -hmm. and the markets change overnight. So what do I spend my money on? Mostly in, in companies. So mm -hmm. I invest into other entrepreneurs mm -hmm. and medical research. These are the two areas I spend most my money in. Mm -hmm. But uh, if I would look into uh, my personal life, mm -hmm. I don't spend that much money except for good food, good sleep, good travels, and good shoes. <laughs> <laughs> Not expensive shoes, actually. <laughs> uh, so do you meditate? Do you? How's your lifestyle? You said good health. Do you invest in a lot of, I mean, I read somewhere uh, recently that this entrepreneur, I think in the US, spends $2 million a year to reverse biohacking, reverse aging. Do you invest in, in that kind of stuff as well? Uh, longevity is a huge topic, especially for people who suddenly made money and now didn't know what to do with it. If you look into, we have a club of business angels. Um, and everybody's hobby project is how can I live longer? Mm -hmm. It seems like a great pattern. Like if people kind of start enjoying their lives, they think about how to prolong their lives. Mm -hmm. No, I don't. I actually focus on medical research, solving uh, rare diseases. Okay. I'm a drop in the ocean. I'm not saying I can do it myself, but mm -hmm. I, that's where I invest into. Uh, not for profit. Mm -hmm. and, and then for longevity, I mean, basic stuff. Like, I invest now into sleep tracking. I just generally, I just recently uh, bought a mattress that tells me how I sleep. Mm. So I do that. I think that's important. Mm -hmm. uh, good food, as I said exercise which i've been slacking for the past few uh, months i must say but yes i do that as well mm -hmm. uh yeah that's it i mean everything else as you said is an experiment right um you want to experiment on your body go ahead but uh i want i want a bit more proof research <laughs> yeah it's you're more research focused i mean if you we don't understand our body that well that we should play with it, especially if I haven't kind of studied it even. I haven't even studied medicine, so <laughs> yeah. how do I even? I mean, you tried yeah. to be a plastic surgeon with that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I failed, right? <laughs> you failed. <laughs> In an internship. <laughs> I, uh, I, did, I do NAD, David Sinclair, I do David. I'm, to be honest, I don't know that much about uh, medical research in NAD. I've watched some of his talks and I'm happy to be the bi guinea pig. <laughs> I've been <laughs> taking NAD for the I mean, last I, w I year. just went to the University of Michigan into the labs uh, mm -hmm. I uh, invest into, and mm -hmm. they told me that they are growing brains, right? I said, oh. what do you mean brains? They said, yeah, out of stem cells, we can grow certain parts of our brain mm -hmm. and then uh, inject diseases and then compare it to a healthy brain. And then they look at it and try to understand, let's say, epilepsy. Mm -hmm. right? What is the difference between a healthy brain and this uh, brain diseased brain? Mm -hmm. And you have all the data, you look into it, and you actually see a brain growing. Mm -hmm. And even then, we don't have the full picture. So how do you just swallow pills <laughs> hoping that that's going to kind of <laughs> give you things. longevity i mean uh, understanding one piece of the puzzle yeah is super hard and it doesn't mean that once you understood one piece of the puzzle that you can then kind of solve the entire puzzle mm -hmm. it is way more complicated so we should be careful of being guinea pigs you don't play with <laughs> yeah. your life i mean you might Die trying yeah, exactly. to live longer. <laughs> it might reverse me in the other way. Yes. And if you mentioned epilepsy. You invest 
in research for that because it's it's personal to you, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, my sister has epilepsy, a rare yeah. form of it, which mm-hmm. uh, happens uh, randomly in every 16,000 births, mm-hmm. which uh, leads to, well, not only seizures, but it also leads to developmental uh, disorders. So she's like a six-year-old, but she's 31. Mm-hmm. So that's something I'm working on. Actually, that's my ultimate why. Yeah. Wow, that's incredible. Coming back to entrepreneurship, why is Dubai a unique hub for entrepreneurs? Because I feel like the whole world is moving here right now. Have you seen the traffic? (laughs) Yes. I I don't only see it, I feel it. (laughs) I mean, it's good. It's it's one of those problems we love to have. It's Mm -hmm. like having too many customers, right? Like I always say to my team, oh, you're out of capacity. Mm -hmm. That's That's great news. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, it comes with success. I think why Dubai is a great place for entrepreneurs is because Dubai, I feel like, is led by entrepreneurs rather than politicians. Like when I look at uh, the uh, leadership here, mm-hmm. I see entrepreneurial mindsets. I see a startup. Right? I see, okay, somebody actually thought about the vision. That is longer than a four-year election cycle. It's mm. 30 years. It's 50 years into the future, which is not obviously great for somebody who has a longer horizon uh, mm-hmm. living here. Now, so startups have few advantages. One, for ex- let's take my company, mm-hmm. sellanycar.com, is not an invention. Right? I didn't invent buying and selling cars. But I saw in different markets how certain problems in the car market Mm -hmm. have been solved. For example, buying any car within 30 minutes. That's something that already existed in England. Yeah. So I said, okay, that's an inspiration. Let's bring it to Dubai and then adapt it to our market. Mm -hmm. But we adapted it by skipping mistakes the others have done. That's what Dubai also does. I mean, not only Dubai, UAE in generally. Yeah. We take the best out of other markets and skip the mistakes, and we do it fast, right? When Mm -hmm. I came here in 2009, and I look at Dubai today, I mean, regulation has changed so many times, which is great, because stuff didn't work out or wasn't really adapted to current times, Mm -hmm. so we change it. It doesn't take 16 years to change a law. It could change within 16 days, which is amazing, because uh, when we talk to regulators, Mm -hmm. we are asked for feedback. Mm -hmm. So as an entrepreneur, your voice is heard. And then it actually changes stuff, Mm -hmm. which is unique. I mean, I was born and raised in Germany. I I had companies in uh, dozens of countries. It's not something we should take as uh, self-explanatory or as a given. Mm -hmm. Most governments don't listen to you that much because it's just very bureaucratic. Mm-hmm. And even if they listen, changes take can take decades, yeah. which is detrimental for an entrepreneur, right? He, he basically needs something. Let's say a law doesn't make sense. Mm-hmm. Why would it take 15 years to change it, right? So that's something we can suggest. So being heard, being fast and changes, also... Thinking entrepreneurially, that's something that has been a success uh, recipe for for the country. I went to Trevor Noah's show last week and he was talking about every time he comes back to Dubai, he's like, Google Maps says this is where the road ends. This is where it ends because there's water here. Like you can't build on that. And Dubai's like, no, we're building here. <laughs> so even Google Maps, I mean, we we defy all odds here in Dubai. And I think. You, how long have you been in Dubai? I've been here close to 10 years. So you know, <laughs> we've created a canal under Sheikh Zayed Road. Yeah. And I didn't feel it. Yeah. How fast did we build that? It I, was I literally overnight. I remember that. Yeah. I didn't even know they lifted the I road. Like, yeah. how, do, how do you do that? Hold on, I still don't know that. <laughs> You've just blown my mind. There's even... water under it now. Like, and there's like, we didn't feel it. Well, yeah, that's, I mean, it was, it's very, very <laughs> fast. And I think it's, uh, we're very lucky and we're very blessed um, to be here. How do you have a work-life balance or don't you? 
my work is my life, so it's balanced. <laughs> <laughs> But there's no <laughs> such thing as taking off because I've never, well, in the last decade, I can't remember just switching off my phone and not being uh, available for my team. Mm -hmm. Doesn't happen. Is it healthy? I don't think so. I don't recommend it, but I, th I don't think I am unhealthy. Uh, but I was unhealthy because I was just, you know, working all the time. And then at night I would eat a pizza or whatever I get and mm -hmm. then no exercise. And I w didn't even know what proteins and carbs are, or whatever is inside each mm -hmm. food item. That's something that actually led to um, a life-threatening situation where mm -hmm. I could die of a stroke or a heart attack. That's actually literally what my doctor told me. So you have to consciously work on that. Mm -hmm. But then generally, I don't, I don't, I do think that everything in life is a competition. Everything is based on a certain choice. So mm -hmm. actually, the fact that you are here is because you won the sperm race. That's yeah. the competition. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, the, okay. the, the, <laughs> that is the fact that you took a decision yeah. basically means you, had, you, you always have an option to do or not do something. So the option you chose won a competition. Mm -hmm. Something you post on social media won a competition against all the posts up yeah. there because the screen size right, is limited. So somebody seeing your post means your post has won a competition against the other posts. Mm -hmm. So generally, everything in life is a competition. In business, we call the choices that we didn't take mm -hmm. opportunity costs. Basically, what did it cost you by not going with the alternative potential income stream? Mm -hmm. And now I say um, in business, if you don't outwork your competitors, if you don't actually focus on your customers more than others, mm -hmm. then the market will just not choose you and you will be the alternative. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about your book, My Kids Will Be Rich. Tell me about your book and the premise of your book. <laughs> It's called My Children Will Be Born Rich. Oh, sorry. <laughs> This is what I, I, I just <laughs> shortened it. <laughs> yeah, you kind of got the gist of <laughs> yeah. it. And Well, it's called My Children Will Be Born Rich. This is what I will teach them. So it's okay. a bit provocative, but it doesn't mean I'll teach them to be spoiled brats. I actually, uh, if you read the subtitle, it says how to win in capitalism and morality. And I think a rich person doesn't necessarily only win in capitalism, mm -hmm. but also in morality, which is how I see uh, good humans being raised. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts? So I don't want to spoil the <laughs> yeah, end because okay. at the end is, there is a reveal and right. you will see how I define success. What are your thoughts on private schooling for children or I guess, I guess sending them to an elite school? Because I'm not sure what the premise of the book. I need to read the book and I, I should have brought it today to get it signed. But uh, I still need to read that. But What are your thoughts on private schooling and elitism when it comes to schooling? Well, I went to a private business school, but I went to public schools before that. Mm -hmm. I think schooling has to totally change. I don't think uh, it needs 13 years to teach stuff we have learned. I think yeah. it needs to be mass customized. Mm -hmm. It needs to be digitized more. And then it needs to have a clear split between social clubs, what I say, the social skills people learn in schools, mm -hmm. how to deal with society, with other people, mm -hmm. and the uh, stuff you learn about history, biology, chemistry, ma mathematics, all of those can be mass customized mm -hmm. based on the aptitudes of the children. And it could be done much faster. I also don't think it has to be done in person. I think what has to be done in person is the social element, which can be a social club. It could be a sports club. It could be uh, two hours every day just focusing on social skills. Mm -hmm. Now this um, school system worldwide is a one-size-fits-all 
slow, non-digital world that was maybe great 100 years ago, but I think it has to adapt. But it takes time. Mm -hmm. So private schooling, well, great. It could be private or public. I don't care who owns it. What I care about is mass customization and then uh, focusing on strength, natural aptitudes Mm -hmm. of humans. And then you will have, well, maximization of uh, value in the market. Right, that that's how I see it. I, I don't think I mean there's a saying, right? Don't teach a fish how to climb a tree. It's yeah. just that's what we're trying. I mean, mm-hmm. how how much do you remember from your chemistry class? Yes, nothing. <laughs> so, <laughs> exactly, because maybe you didn't like it, but mm-hmm. or maybe you weren't really in, interested because somebody didn't teach it in a way uh, that was Beneficial. mass customized for you. Mm-hmm. Right? I went to a private business school. Uh, that, well, elite is a is a word. How do you define elite? By having a s- strong filtering mechanism or very hard to get in type of schools. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, we were 85 students out of, I don't know, 10,000 applications, I mm-hmm. think. So if you say that's how you define elite, then yeah, it was hard to get in. Mm-hmm. But then what did I get out of it? I got, I think, a strong network of people that think alike in terms of had a vision of achieving something in life, maybe Mm -hmm. entrepreneurs. I think half of our uh, graduates became entrepreneurs, Mm -hmm. which is something which helped me. So it's one of the things, as I I said, keep those people that have the right values, uh, similar visions close to you so you get motivated. They become mentors. Even though they are your peers, Mm -hmm. they become mentors. The mentors is not always the next person the billionaire next to you that doesn't have to be your mentor mm-hmm. could be anybody that kind of pushes you towards your goals and i think that was good will i say that i could only get it in a school like that i don't think so but it's probably uh easier to achieve if you kind of are with 85 people rather than 20,000 people studying mm-hmm. you might be just not building these bonds so your public schooling your your high school was a public school. Yeah. So were your parents rich or are you the first <laughs> entrepreneur? <in your? laughs> My parents weren't rich, actually quite the opposite. We right. lived in a one bedroom. Uh and my mother actually um was a lawyer. But then the minute my sister was born, actually like six months later, she had to stop working. Mm-hmm. And she spent years in hospitals on and off. So um, she couldn't really earn money uh, for the past 31 years now. She's just uh, taking care of my sister, which is a full-time job, obviously. Yeah. And my father came uh, later. Um, he's a veterinary, veterinarian, mm-hmm. and he has uh, not been allowed to work in Germany, so he went cleaning factories. You think about it. He actually had a PhD cleaning factories as a janitor. Uh, until he was allowed. Back then, you had to study again. It took him like four years to get it uh, approved in Germany. Mm-hmm. So for many years, we actually just, you know, were barely making ends meet. I didn't feel it because uh, I was a child. Mm-hmm. For me, it was normal um, to not be able to afford everything or a lot of things. But yeah. we had us, and that's all I needed. My parents were refugees when they left Afghanistan, and... It's interesting. I mean, we grew up in Australia, same in two bedrooms. There were four siblings, and uh, I didn't feel it at all growing up. But I think I realized only a few years ago. I was like, "Hang on, were we poor? I mean, we weren't <laughs> poor, but like middle class, very middle class, and even schooling." Um, coming back to your book, so would you send your children to an elite school, and would you leave the money, for example, because there's a lot of you know, different schools of thought, for example, with like Bill Gates, Tom Hanks, a lot of successful entrepreneurs will say that they wouldn't leave money behind for their children. Would you or do you want a similar upbringing for your children that you had? So I'm not a fan of the school system, I told you. So I would think hard, actually, until 
I can choose a school that I am uh, I agree with. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't know yet, but I think it's going to be uh, probably the best school I am convinced of. Mm-hmm. Right? It doesn't have to be the most expensive. It just has to be the one I believe in most. Mm-hmm. Now, in terms of leaving money, uh, I definitely would leave them money. I'm not just unnecessarily going to make their lives hard, mm-hmm. but it depends on the timing. I think if you spoil them too early, mm-hmm. then it's something they, if you take away the hunger, you're going to make them starve. And that's, that's, that's hard to imagine, right? If you, if you actually are not hungry, you can starve because yeah. you don't know how to feed yourself. So you have to time it really well. And I talked to uh, older uh, entrepreneurs who went through that. And they had a, a great system. Um, mm-hmm. I mean... I have a foundation. They build uh, trust structures and foundations that ha- can have more complicated structures than just a will, mm-hmm. right? So you can put rules. You can say, all right, for example, one one structure was really nice. I liked it. He said, I'm going to give my children a million dollars or euros back then each mm-hmm. when they turn 18. Mm-hmm. And until they are 30, they have to have turned that million into 10 million. Wow. And if they did that, then I'm going to release the rest. And back then he was, I don't know, 600, 700 million dollars net worth. So mm-hmm. he had a lot. And he said, I said, what if it doesn't work? He said, then I'm going <laughs> to donate it to a bird protection uh, foundation <laughs> in Europe. <laughs> I said, that's <laughs> funny. <laughs> so it was, a re- it was really... Um, a motivation for the children to say, well, we don't Turn want, we love birds, but we don't love them that much. <laughs> 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 so you can build in some uh, incentive structures, right? Mm-hmm. But unnecessary uh, well. unnecessary burdens, uh, why would I do that? I mean, I know if my parents had more, they would have given me more. So, But you see this a lot. For example, one generation builds it and the next one gets spoiled and blows yeah. all the money and then... I mean, Bruce Lee is another great example. I think he's not leaving any money. His kids are actually really struggling. I think one of them's homeless and the other one's banished, something dramatic like that. Um, but, yeah. Well, that's his choice. Where can we buy your book? Where can we follow you? My book is available on Amazon here, mm-hmm. right? So you can just buy it or actually in stores, but in Europe, not here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think it's the best shop you can buy from, right? Yeah. It's buy from Amazon. Mm-hmm. Do you still have shares in Amazon? Or No. Oh, you don't. Okay, so no. once you sold it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, m- I might have, uh, <laughs> now that you say it. but <laughs> You're not. like, maybe I do, maybe I don't. I need to yeah. check. <laughs> I might have. I'm not sure. And I have to check. But it's not like a big deal. Yeah. Where can people follow you? Uh wherever they want i'm uh, available on social media Mm -hmm. so on all the big platforms and uh yeah that's uh, just my name sagan yelch and where can they buy a car a car yes so or sell a car sorry (laughs) well look that's a great question because we've now launched a year and a half ago we launched carnap Mm -hmm. carnap is where you can buy a car with 10 days free returns, no questions asked, two Mm -hmm. years warranty. So that's where consumers can get the Amazon experience when they want to buy cars. Right. So Carnap, actually in Arabic, Arnab means rabbit. Mm. So it's a wordplay. So you'll see a little rabbit on on Uh, our logo. Oh, (laughs) cute. So Carnap, so you can nab a car, look at it that way as well. Yeah, right. But then if you're a car dealer, Right, you can buy cars from our dealer portal and sell any car. If you mm-hmm. want to sell a car, I mean, yep. obviously, sellanycar.com. So again, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much as well.